Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. Today we'll be discussing affordability and how Americans are navigating budget balancing and keeping the economy running. I'm Dave Soika, member of the Equifax Risk Advisors team. And this group identifies economic considerations and leverages data and analytics to translate industry insights and recommendations. Ultimately, these insights support our clients in navigating economic uncertainty while uncovering hidden opportunities in consumer credit risk. I'm pleased to welcome back our panel of experts in the Risk Advisors Group, Maria Turbe, Jesse Harden, Tom O'Neill, and our practice leader, Thomas Aliff. Welcome, team. Hope you had a great holiday and are staying warm. Hey, Dave. Happy New Year. Thanks, Dave. Trying. Happy New Year, Dave. We shall see about affordability when we get our gas bills this month. <laughs> I'd prefer not to see that. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is our first podcast of the year and a slight shift as we discuss affordability and what it means for our clients as they manage their book of business. The holiday shopping season just ended. And will we find out if the consumer delivered coal in the stockings of retailers? Or was there a wonderful package under the tree? Consumers are dealing with a lack of affordable housing, auto, higher grocery prices, and excess savings is drying up and consumers have returned to using credit like never before. But before we begin our discussion, David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics, will share a quick economic update. David? Recent economic data is mixed. We see several positive, but also negative trends. Uh, One bright spot is retail sales, which have outperformed expectations, growing 0.6% month over month in December and are up 5.6% yearly, which is a very strong number. However, this growth rate is slower than previous years. and, And really there's a little bit of a drag showing up from higher interest rates, slower job growth and reduced spending from excess savings. So still a healthy retail sales number, just not as healthy as it was in other years. Uh, Consumer confidence is rising and really we think uh, falling inflation is really helping drive that. The University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Survey shows an increase in optimism. Really, so that is a strong positive note. We do have to take that with some caution, though, because the current level of this index is actually quite high and is a bit more consistent with uh, a recession. And so it is is something that's a bit of a concern. So it's, it's, I I would say this is a mixed signal overall. A positive signal is that we are seeing um, an acceleration in industrial production. So that's been that rose in December, Um, and this trend is expected to continue because retail sales are still strong. Um, However, um, there are some headwinds. Uh, Business inventories have stabilized um, after a real ramp up in 2022. So the retail uh, sector is well supplied right now. And so inventory growth will slow to some degree, and that could be a, a drag on GDP. We're also monitoring the real estate market. It faces challenges due to high interest rates and affordability concerns. And really, this has led to a slowdown in buyer activity and stagnant prices overall. The, the good news, though, is that home builder optimism is increasing, reflecting in a rise, you know, and that's reflected in a rise in the NAHB's housing market index. Home builders may be expecting a, a cut in interest rates from the Federal Reserve, and we think this will help drive uh, some of that optimism and hopefully uh, rejuvenate the real estate market. Uh, while some sectors are showing signs of you know, resilience and optimism, others we could see are met with some challenges from you know, high interest rates and affordability interests affordability issues. You know, so the economic outlook is mixed with generally positive trends in retail sales and consumer confidence, but there is it is also being tempered by slower growth expectations um, and challenges in the real estate market. Thank you, David. U.S. consumers did not rein in their spending this past holiday season and now have record-breaking debt balances to show for it, according to the Federal Reserve data released earlier this month. Consumer borrowing spiked by almost $24 billion in November, more than doubling economist expectations for a $9 billion increase and sending outstanding credit balances north of $5 trillion for the first time on record. This monthly increase during the holiday shopping month was driven by higher rates of revolving credit, which mostly includes credit cards, which soared by nearly $20 billion, the third highest monthly increase on record that goes back to 1943. Higher revolving debt balances can be a reflection of population growth and increased card usage, as well as higher rates of economy-powering consumer spending. 
The report does not show how credit is being used or whether the outstanding balances are being paid off before interest starts to accrue them. According to a recent Forbes article, consumers spent more and longer than I think we all expected. The big question for January will be, have they finally run out of money? So now that we've kind of laid the land on the consumer side, Jesse, can you give us a little flavor for inflation? And before we begin, just really want to kind of tailor this to say about, you know, the issue of consumer goods affordability in America has been growing concern for many years. So it's not really a new topic, but it's been continued to be a major concern through the end of 2023. And according to a McKinsey report, the U.S. consumers were sending mixed signals in an uncertain economy. While they were worried about rising prices and job security, they were optimistic and still spending. So what details can you share around CPI and inflation? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Affordability, you know, it's something that always interests me to talk about, especially from an economic standpoint. I think as we talk about affordability, though, and the impact it has on Americans, I think we should, uh, you know, it helps to remember that we look at economic data holistically to tell a story, but the economic measures that we look at, they they can't always paint a picture of how every individual is faring in their everyday lives. For example, you know, we've talked about inflation, how it's cooled since peaking in 2022. And that's certainly good news for Americans. But prices still fluctuate, you know, for some everyday core household goods. And those fluctuations can really have a pronounced impact on how Americans manage their, their, you know, their budgets. So the economic data indicates that the U.S. is headed in the right direction, but we may still hear and, and feel grumblings from Americans who are still feeling the pain, you know, when they go to purchase necessities. So digging a little bit more into the CPI report, um, you know, food prices increased just just modestly in December. They were up 20 basis points or 0.2%, the same as it was in November. Egg prices, uh, as an example, surged 9% in the month, but they're still down 24% annually. In terms of energy prices, they rose uh, for 40 basis points or 0.4%. Um, and, and that was after a slide, a pretty good slide that we saw in November of 2.3%. Uh, gasoline was something that rose uh, pretty substantially in December. And, um, and so I think the good news is that there's a host of goods and services that are actually moving into a deflationary mode. When we look at, uh, when we look at those prices on a year-over-year basis, meaning that those prices of goods and services are actually falling. And a perfect example would be what we talked about with egg prices. Uh, you know, we just mentioned those. We saw the spike in, in uh, egg prices in December. So, cons- but, but really, when we think about it, consumers are still paying 24% less for eggs than they did a year ago. And there's a similar story for other food products like lettuce, tomatoes, cheese, coffee. All of those have seen a single digit decrease year over year. And it's not just, you know, food products where we're seeing that deflationary trend. Things like energy prices overall uh, with fuel, oil, gas services for homes and gasoline for cars, those are all off uh, 15%, 14%, and 2% respectively. And that's going to help households in more ways than one. Uh, when we think about the, um, the the gas that you put in your car, the, the oil that you use to heat your house, those are cheaper and that's certainly more beneficial. But then it's also cheaper for manufacturing to transport goods and services. Um, Other prices that are experiencing uh, deflationary uh, decreases like airfares, car rentals, computers are down 4%, wireless services. Uh, So there is good news there. I will call out, um, as we look at data, one thing that we have to be mindful of is uh, there are nuances in the data. So a good example would be health health insurance. So health insurance uh, prices are down 27% year over year, which sounds like a great story. Uh, We have to know a little bit more about that data, though the Bureau of Labor Statistics measures health insurance not on premiums paid, uh, but they measure it on insurance company profits. And so, um, though those profits are are down, indicating that there is a uh, you know a decrease in in the price that consumers are paying it, that that's really not translating into a consumer benefit. So, really, just again, we have to kind of know the data that we're looking at. So, I've probably caught, gone on too long here, but I'd say the good news is that signs are pointing to a deceleration in goods and services for 24, um, you know, nearing the Fed's inflationary goal of two and a half percent. And, you know, I think it couldn't really come at a better time, given that consumers are, you know, still accumulating debt and they are still living uh, paycheck to paycheck. Thanks for the insights, Jesse. Yeah. Touched on a lot of goods, but wanted to uh, ask 
Thomas. Uh, according to a report from Edmonds, the average new auto loan payment rose to $739 a month, which is up slightly from the $736 a month in Q3 of last year and higher than the $717 in Q4 of 2022. In addition, down payment averages uh, crossed the $7,000 mark for the first time, ending up at $7,074 in Q4 of 2023 compared to just over $6,900 in Q3 and $6,700 in Q4 of 2022. These are sizable increases. How do auto buyers navigate the auto market? I think it's such a great question, uh, Dave. And you know, one of the things that I you know I was thinking about that from the perspective of the borrower, it's definitely challenging with this environment. But the auto lending space is not new. Uh, to underwriting based on affordability. Specifically, they've been incorporating um, you know, it, many things beyond you know, a credit score for years. Payment to income has been you know, arguably the most important variable in underwriting in the auto space for decades, uh, followed closely by debt to income, you know, the credit score, of course, and then loan to value. And so when we're doing some of those considerations, you know, you, of course, we have seen higher uh, you know, monthly payments, the highest on average in the way that you, you did describe that. You know, over seven hundred dollars now on new vehicles. The average total on a portfolio is just you know hovering above five hundred now as well. So we're we're certainly seeing some uh, some impact associated with that. But I think it's really important to also understand what are the risks when you incorporate the credit score. How has it been shifting or uh, pivoting as well? And then also in addition to that, uh, you know the. Have, you know, what are the increase or decrease in risk when you overlay and matrix that with the credit score leveraging payment to income, the total debt to income, uh, and then in addition to that, where where are values sitting? So I, I'm very interested. You know, outside of monitoring and tracking what the total monthly payment is uh, for that vehicle, what's happening with the vehicle values? Because with, with vehicle values, that's going to be one of the aspects that uh, you know, could end up driving some downstream impacts because it, as the, the values drop especially as, as terms are getting a little bit longer uh, on, on these you know, loans. Amortization is going to be a little more, uh, I guess, hard to reach and stay above water for the consumer. That's where I, I think you know, some of the challenges could potentially come in if the values of vehicles end up dropping at some point in the future. Thanks. Tom, to you. So we just heard about rising auto prices, higher down payments, higher monthly payments. And so as many Americans are spending more on a car, how does this impact their ability to afford a new house or to rent an apartment? Uh, well, thanks, Dave. Well, uh, obviously, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't help. Uh, and, and of course, the, the reverse is also true. Uh, even without you know, rising auto payments, I mean, Jesse just rattled off a whole slew of, of, in some cases, deflationary, but still data showing the impact of the inflation that we've been dealing with for the last couple of years. Um, and, and as such, you know, Americans are already facing the worst housing affordability crisis that we've seen in, in quite a long time. Uh, and this this holds true to both sides of the coins that you, you asked about, you know, both owning and, and renting uh, side of, of housing. Uh, so, for example, in, in home ownership, um, just did a, a quick check and, and saw that the average 30-year mortgage rate you know, right now is about 7.3%. Um, and combine that with the you know, current median home price, you know, median, not, not average. So you know, it means half of the, the homes are under this amount and half are over. But that median price is about 387000 um, So, uh, and, and according to the, the uh, current U.S. Census, the, the median household income is a, a little over 74000 or about $6,200 a month. So with all of this, we could do the math, and, and if we assume that someone can put down the, the standard 20% down payment on a home purchase, we'd, we'd have a monthly mortgage payment of about $2,127 on that median-priced home that I, I mentioned. That's over 34% of the, the median household income that, that I just you know, uh, put out there. And, and keep in mind that the ratio that lenders want to see is 28% or less when they're, when they're lending you know, mortgages. Uh, so that 34%, which doesn't even count the insurance and taxes that, that lenders incorporate into that ratio, basically means that the median home price is well outside the affordability of the median household uh, income right now. 
Uh, and on the flip side of the coin, as we mentioned, the, the rental data is, you know, which can be pretty scattered due to, you know, a variety of factors like, you know, what different people you know, count in that rental property and what's included in those rental expenses. But regardless, you know, uh, it's not difficult to see that the stresses the, the individuals are facing, you know, come to fruit in that area as well. We, we see estimates of about 25% of Americans paying almost half or more of their income on rent. Uh, which is way beyond the the 30% threshold that economists consider you know, as affordable. Uh, and, and of course, you know, pulling back a little bit, you know, we, we speak about these different verticals in isolation, but people have to deal with all of this simultaneously. You know, decreasing housing affordability impacts you know the amount that's left over for food, which, as you know, Jesse said, you know, while yeah, you know, some of that has been yeah you know, coming down in in recent you know, months, yeah. You know, over the last few years, that's risen dramatically. You have less, so you know, less left over after housing and and uh, food. You know, buying food and having a, a shelter that impacts your ability to to buy or maintain a vehicle, and and so on and so on. So it's not just that you know this is an instance where one domino knocks over another, but in essence, those dominoes are set up in a circle where tipping one over could cause the whole thing to collapse. Hey, Tom, if I may, you know, I think you bring up a really interesting point as well when you think about affordability for auto and home. I think another area that you mentioned uh, that's really interesting is the affordability of insurance on both of those uh, sectors. You know, for many Americans, getting insurance on an automobile or their home has become a budget-breaking task. With the premiums uh, increasing, we've already seen, you know, those those, those premiums really strain those budgets. You know, I wondered a little bit why, um, you know, why do the premiums just keep increasing? And it's interesting when you look at it, you know, insurance or, uh, um, underwriters are coming off of some of their worst years in history. And when you think about the, the catastrophic damage from the storms and wildfires, you know, that's a huge reason. Warmer climates are contributing to, you know, these storms that, um, you know, that also then contribute to droughts in other areas and wildfire risks. And, you know, then you have a housing boom where those houses are being built in those same spots. So, you know, it, it's interesting, I think, when you think of uh, the impact that, um, you know, that that has, the, the impact that inflation has, when you think about uh, the, the raw materials and labor that go into, you know, both houses and autos, and then climate change making it harder to measure the risks, you know, that, that insurers have. So I think all those perils really are going to push insurers, from what I see, into to uh, where we are now, which is they're increasing premiums to cover losses, um, you know, and, and in some cases they're pulling out of markets. You know, last year insurance premiums outpaced inflation. And so, you know, in some instances, if the insurer is not getting the price increase that they approved, uh, or if it's not approved by the state regulator, then they're leaving the state altogether. And I think it, you know, it seems to have a profound impact then on the the insurance consumer who's left really with few options in terms of they either take the the increase in premium or they have to go and, and shop around. And in some instances, there's nothing to find. You know, so I think it's going to be something really interesting to continue to follow in 2024. Yeah, and, and think about the implications of that, yeah, Jesse. I mean, you, right now we talk about affordability uh, in terms of the stress that it puts on in, an individual, um, which is absolutely the case. But when you start, you know, pulling back and realizing, okay, this is now we're talking about, you know, where people can even buy and insure a home. Yeah, this is now impacting, you know, movement of of people. It's it's you know impacting where people choose and or you know, have an option to live, which of course will drive you know, where industries locate. And it, it's, it's, not, it, it's not a stretch to think that you know, we're going to see some, some pretty seismic sociological shifts you know, over the next couple of years because of the things that we're talking about here today. Agreed. Maria, so let's bring it down to the, to the people. You know, we've spoken about the K-shaped economy meaning some, some Americans are doing well and others are struggling, but those are broad categories. What have you seen in our data or in the news about how this economy is impacting Americans differently by even by generational categories? Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, Tom discussed housing affordability and, and tying back to housing, we observe uh, changes in historic trends. What the Wall Street Journal refers to as the rise of the forever renters, while home ownership has tended to increase with age, 
the median age of renters has moved from 37 to 41 in the last uh, 20 plus years on Zillow's, based on Zillow's um, census data. Uh, specifically, millennials are not as eager to transition from renting to owning, given other perks found in rental communities, including money saving. So while almost 57% of Gen Xers and almost 59% of baby boomers were owners at a median age of 34, it's at 53% for millennials. We will have to wait and see if these statistics reverse back to historic trends for Gen Zers. Um, what we do here, we are in January after all, is that the new year resolutions across age groups are heavily focused on financial resolutions in 2024 versus exercise or healthier eating habits and dieting that took center stage in previous years. Uh, based on a survey conducted by Bankrate towards the end of the year, paying down debt is at the top of the list, uh, followed by finding a higher paying job or an additional source of income and, and saving money uh, for emergencies as well. Uh, buying a home was on the list of these financial goals, but towards the bottom. So um, we do see uh, the Gen Zers' concern of living uh, paycheck to paycheck uh, at the high and the high cost of living, uh, for example, as a deterrence for spending. They, they are cooking at home more. They're spending less on clothes and are focusing on the essentials when they go grocery shopping. They might be influencer driven versus millennials um, experiences focus, but they are exhibiting more traditional financial behaviors expected from older generations. And, and it's not just the U.S. Gen Zers. Uh, based on Deloitte's uh, survey, uh, these behaviors and responses to tough economic times are observed in Gen Zers in other countries as well. Well, Maria, let, let's hope that those resolutions to uh, pay down debt and, and save, you know, meet better fates than my exercise resolution in previous years. No one can see that. Yeah, I was going to say, Tom, we're only like, uh, what, 10 days in? <laughs> I mean, my, mine are bad, but I, I mean, 10 days, geez. <laughs> the best thing about the financial goals is no one will know but you if you fail or not. <laughs> so great. Really appreciate the discussion today, team. Great insights. You know, again, high inflation has clouded Americans' views of the overall economy and has sapped away their earnings. And obviously, as Maria talked about, people are being more judicious in how they spend. On the more positive side, U.S. consumers' expectations for inflation one year from now have fallen to their lowest levels in three years, according to CNN.com. We'll see where the chips fall. And if things change, you'll hear about it from us. That's all for now. I'd like to thank Jesse, Tom, Maria, and Thomas for joining me today. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's topic. And if you have questions, suggestions for future podcasts, or other items, please reach out to us at riskadvisors at equifax.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.